Okay, let's let's begin then. Hey, welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Um, tonight we're having an, an interesting signing talk, um, and we've all focused on the the drinking beer part of it, but it's about William Lassell as well and telescopes and planets. Um, um, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, welcome to Gerard Gillian, who's going to tell us about that in a little while. I've just got a few slides up front um, telling you what, what, what's happening in the society and what's coming up next, um, and then uh, on to the main event of the evening. Uh, well, this is the backdrop I'm using uh, for my slides tonight, and as you're all no doubt very well aware, we've had this amazing aurora, and you must have seen millions of pictures all over the internet. I've picked out a couple here that I think are really quite special that Ramsey McIver uh, has done. Uh, as I said in the newsletter at the weekend, the poor old crescent moon with us, I didn't really get a look in, but because of the amazing aurora, but Ramsey has really picked that out nicely with the reflections on the water over the fourth. And I think that's that's over Craig Leith. Is that what that island is, I think? In, over near North Berwick. Not sure what that one's called. Yeah, I, I think to... that was Craig Leith, yeah. I think, but I'd be wrong. And this is another one which is definitely over the Bass Rock, which is a, an amazing um, image. Beautiful colours there as well. And it really was pink. Very nice. Thank you, Ramsey. Um, I did put a, a news item on our website and gathered together lots of members images on there so you can have a look uh, on the front page of our website uh, i restricted everyone to, to to up to three images each otherwise um, we would run out of disk space very quickly for the amount of images that we've actually had but it really was amazing as a, a remote observatory in spain um, I, I thought i'd give you a little update on that um, We've been telling you for ages that it's almost there, it's almost there, it's almost there, almost there. I think it was actually there for one hour. It worked perfectly for one hour, and then the panel, the flat panels failed. So um, but we did have it working for one whole hour, I reckon, and then it, it stopped working again. So um, setting up a remote observatory has proved to be a lot more interesting and challenging than any of us ever thought it would be. But we are almost there again. Uh, the weather's pretty foul in Spain at the moment. It's much nicer here in Scotland, so um, we're not missing any any clear skies now. Um, I've picked up a, a few new pictures from various places that you may not have seen before. Um, there has been a fair bit of snow up there recently. I don't know how, how recent these are, but those are the six observatory buildings that there currently are um, with the, the roof, off, um, roofs. And they do actually have solar panels at the other end as well, which presumably work when not covered in snow. And this is a, a nice, presumably a drone, shot um, of our observatory that I haven't seen before. That shows the spacing between the telescopes. One of the benefits for having a bigger observatory that we're in now is um, lower walls or um, a better sky access. One of the downsides is it's slightly more exposed to the wind as well, which we, which we have discovered. And that is our telescope there. And then I've got this side-by-side -side system of a 0.3 meter Newtonian and a, an apochromatic uh, refractor on there. There is actually now a public page on our website. We haven't really formally launched as a road to the rest of the world um, until we got it totally working. I think the fact we had it working for an hour means I can start to, to talk about it a little more. And, and I think we'll probably um, launch it more when we get to our centenary event in October as well. But um, there's, a, there's, a, news, there's, a, there's a, a page on there about why we did what we did and what projects we're running with it as well. So have a look at that now, but that is public on our main website. These are the talks that are coming up in the next uh, couple of months. So on the 7th of June, we have Exploring the Dark Universe with Professor Andy Taylor. Um, that is also our AGM. So please make a special effort to be there either in person in Edinburgh at the Augustine United Church or on, on Zoom if you can. It should be very short. There are no elections this year. That's a, a change. They're, they're now every two years. So it is um, a few formalities about reviewing um last year's minutes and the annual report and a few things like that so please please make an effort to be there on the 12th of june we have our usual imaging and observing group meeting and that will be on zoom for members only on the 21st of june um we have um, a talk that nigel's just just booked on digital skies for ancient contexts using python to investigate 
Stellar data from Ramesside Starhawks. Interesting. <laughs> Not quite sure what any of that means, but it's, it's it should be should be an interesting talk. On the 5th of July, um, this will be an in-person one again um, at the Augustine United Church and on Zoom for members and YouTube for visitors. Stellar Winds, Givers and Takers of Life from Dr. Brad Gibson. And then the last one before our August break, uh, we've managed to get uh, Professor Catherine Haymans to, to talk to us. So um, you, as you know, Catherine's not being great after COVID, but she will be joining us online uh, for this, uh, certainly at the end. So Catherine has been recording her talks on videos and we'll be watching the video and then she'll be there live to answer questions at the end and have the, the questions and answers. And Catherine is one of our honorary uh, residents. So that, that will always be good because Catherine's always a, a good speaker. And then that's it. We have um, the whole month of August off after another very busy year. And Nigel has already um, booked out the next uh, six months of interesting talks. So I have lots to look forward to after that. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, can I introduce Jared Gilligan? So over to you, Jared. I think Jared is in Liverpool at the moment and he's going to tell us about William Lassell. So over to you, Jared. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Um, just uh, self organized. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you to Mark and to Nigel. Um, I just wanted to note that Nigel contacted me in June last year. Um, didn't seem so long ago, but uh, uh, it's a very kind invitation. I'm always glad to share my uh, my research with people. Um, congratulations to you, uh, Edinburgh, for your 100th uh, anniversary. Uh, I hope your celebrations go well. Um, I too saw the aurora, and who didn't? Um, the uh, pictures are still coming in from our members. Um, you know you. You, a lot of people, I think, uh, used up all their SD card space. It was uh, such a, a memorable night. Um, so the subject of tonight, uh, without further ado, is William LaSalle. Now, first of all, can I just correct myself? The true pronunciation of his surname is LaSalle, to um, coincide with the, uh, uh, the other word, hassle. But if you'll forgive me and bear with me, I'm going to prefer to use LaSalle. Um, I, he's been an interest of mine for over 30 years. Um, and uh, he was actually, believe it or not, Dr. Alan Chapman, who got me involved in researching him. Both his family history, his cultural aspects in my neck of the woods, and of course, his, his astronomical achievements. Um, what happened was that uh, Alan Chapman came to Liverpool to deliver the first William Cell Memorial Lecture to my own society at Liverpool, and um, he noticed that we had a display about William at the back of our lecture theatre, and uh, was about to start researching a, a paper for the journal Vistas of Astronomy, about LaSalle and uh, wanted some help. So various people, including myself in Liverpool, helped him. And at the time I was doing my own family history and found that William LaSalle was, was much more interesting. So I dropped my own family history research and concentrated on him. Um, this is really the uh, uh, what will happen tonight, really, just his early life. The connection with clocks and of course brewing business early telescopes uh, his observatory became the center of the universe at that time uh, as regards uh, uh, professional astronomers the story about the discovery and the observa first observation of the planet neptune and the moon triton and the cell's involvement in that meeting royalty uh, which the cell did and then trips to malta his great build, uh, the 48-inch telescope, and then his retirement down south to Maidenhead uh, near Royal Windsor. 
I can't, and I'll be drummed out of Liverpool if I did not mention Jeremiah Horrocks, who is a true Liverpoolian, a fellow scouter like myself. Famous, of course, for his prediction and observation of the transit of Venus across the solar disk in uh, late uh, 1639. And of course, his also his lunar theory, his study of the tides, and he had lived beyond his young age of 24 years. I, I think he probably would have become more famous and more renowned you know, than uh, Isaac Newton, but I'm biased when I talk about my fellow Liverpoolian. William Lassell, he's not actually a Scouser. He was born in Bolton in June 1799. His father, Nathaniel, was a timber merchant. He was actually educated in Bolton and then at Rochdale Academy. Um, and the Lassell family were congregationists. The Rochdale Academy was actually for more uh, education the uh, boys into being businessmen um, but Latin mathematics and uh, cultural aspects of teaching uh, were mainly um, taught in the academy not really sciences as such his father Pad uh, sadly died in 1810 and the family moved back to Liverpool in 1815 of course, the mother was the head of the family by then. But there was a track record of the Lassell family being well established in the Toxteth Park area of Liverpool as clock and watchmakers. At the Toxteth area of Liverpool, uh, Preston, Prescott and the Warrington uh, uh, town, that triangular area of Lancashire were prominently in uh, regard to clock and watchmaking and also to chrono naval and maritime chronometers uh, were, were mainly manufactured around there. Um, there are two prominent members of the family, Thurston Ellisal, 1693 to 1758, his great grandfather, and William, his grandfather, 1736 to 1816, were both prominent clock and watchmakers. But there were also other members of the family that were involved in the manufacture of parts of watches and clocks, and also uh, woodwork uh, manufacturers to do with the clock casements. Um, these are some of the examples of Lissell clocks, which I've found over the years through uh, finding them in antique shops and also on the internet. And um, these were the, the, the main, the, what we would call grandfather clocks or long case clocks. I'm not a clock and watch expert, but uh, as you can see, um, they were very ornately decorated, the clock mechanisms and um, very fine woodworking as well. And um, if you do find one of these for sale, I'm sure you will have to spend um, quite a bit of money to get one in your hallway. But uh, do look out for them. And there, there are a few of them which were twins. Um, um, I have found one that was in Scotland, uh, in parts of Scotland, in Oban, that was named Toxteth. And its, its twin was actually found in Devon, and that was called Park. And uh, these twins um, uh, are very rarely together in the same um, household. Now, surprisingly enough, he didn't follow his father into the timber merchant business or his uh, other members of the family into clock and watchmaking, although it's possible. And we can, in hindsight, think that uh, he probably may have got his astronomical interest through his family members who were in clock and watchmaking and perhaps chronometers as well. But his business and his career were um, all uh, to do with brewing. And the place to do it was in fact Liverpool. Um, and he established himself after an apprenticeship um, in 1824 in his own brewing business in Milton Street, Liverpool, which I'll mention more about in a moment. And you won't be surprised that um, 
this city was expanding uh, after the 1800s and it was 600 breweries in the city at that time. The illustration you can see is a brewery from about 1834, but it gives you an idea uh, of what the breweries were like. They weren't what you would call factory type ones. They were literally on street corners and they would supply their own um, establishments. Again, more about that later. William um, married in 1827, but he married the sister of Alfred King, who was the gas engineer for Liverpool. And uh, he, Alfred, had an interest in astronomy as well. And because with uh, Alfred's other brother, Joseph, they would have little star parties to the bottom of William LaSalle's garden. And through this relationship, he uh, met their sister, Maria, and they married in 1827. And as you can see, those are the two marriage portraits that were produced uh, as, as wedding gifts um, by the family, and the family still have them today. The Blacksters live in Glasgow, uh, I wanted to mention, and um, one of the uh, descendants was actually featured on the Antiques Roadshow um, in the latest, uh, latest series, which was featured in Glasgow. Now then, um, there is a cultural connection and the expansion of Liverpool as a maritime port, and that was its dock system. Um, to keep the workers who built the docks on site and not to make them wander off to quench their thirst in alehouses, the cell would bring his ale to them instead of the other way around. So it would keep the workers on site building the docks. And as you can see, the Liverpool's docks were expanding exponentially over uh, quite a, a short years. The famous Albert Dock opened in 1846 and 17 docks were built between 1830 and 1860 and five docks even opened in just one year, 1848, all presided over by Jesse Hartley, um, the famous uh, docks engineer. Um, and as you can see there, the portrait, uh, someone's not paid their dock building bill and he's a bit grumpy by the looks of it. But it looks as if because these expanding docks brought in workers from all over the United Kingdom, uh, LaSalle's brewery uh, grew very big indeed. And of course, not uh, the money uh, was flowing in and the beer was flowing out, so to speak. So he actually became fairly rich in a short space of time, in spite of there being 600 other breweries in Liverpool at this time. This is a, a modern day illustration, but it just shows you the dock system in the River Mersey. Now, as you may know, the River Mersey is a tidal um, river. And before the docks, uh, the first docks were built in about the 1750s, ships had to stay out in Liverpool Bay and smaller vessels went out of the bigger ships to unload because of the um, the, the, the ship's hulls where they couldn't get up the river. So when the tide was in, uh, they were able to go into tidal docks at high tide, go into a dock, close the dock gates, and of course the tide would go out, but the, the ships could still be unloaded or reloaded with goods. And then when the tide came in, the dock gates were opened and the ships could go back out to sea. So these docks uh, became very, very useful. And of course, hundreds of thousands of ships came into Liverpool and it grew as a maritime port again in a very short space of time, primarily in the Victoria, Victorian era. Um, it wasn't only due to it being a maritime uh, trading port, it was also uh, a hub for uh, immigration. Um, the most famous immigration period was, of course, to do with the Irish potato famine. Um, a lot of people, a lot of the Irish came to Liverpool and went either to America or to Europe. 
and uh, quite a number of them did stay in Liverpool. But in fact, the biggest migration was from Scotland uh, to Liverpool, and uh, it became Liverpool became a great um, shipbuilding centre as well. And on the right hand side is actually it's a 1950s map, but also the railways and the canals, which helped um, take goods to and from Liverpool to the northwest, all over England, in fact. Um, and the uh, in combination with the canal system, and all these factors made Liverpool grow into a, a gigantic, big, successful maritime port, especially in the Victorian age. And hence, uh, LaSalle became a very rich uh, uh, maritime merchant to do with his brewing business. Now, um, he was a common brewer. He produced about 1,000 barrels of beer at different grades six, eight, and 10 pence. The Beer Act of 1830 repealed the duty on strong beers and cider, permitting free trade in beer and cider. Uh, almost 25,000 licenses were taken out in England within six months. 800 beer shops opened in Liverpool alone within 19 days of the new act coming into force. By 1840, <coughs> Liverpool had 600 brewers each supplying their own group of beer shops, gin palaces, public houses, and brothels, which also sold beer and other things. And if you want to know more about the British brewing industry, and I'm sure you are interested, then I recommend the book I've, I've referenced at the bottom of this slide. Um, these are illustrations, not really of of uh, LaSalle's brewery in Milton Street, Liverpool, but gives you an idea of uh, uh, what was going on at the time and the fact he was supplying his own pubs and gin houses, which were close by. But on a map of Liverpool for 1847, I have actually identified where his brewery was in Milton Street. And in fact, it was in an area not too far away from the docks, uh, and the many factories and foundries that supplied the many engineering works and the railways in Liverpool. So it was a place he could easily go to, to find a foundry that could make his speculum mirrors for his telescopes. And so before long, uh, being a rich merchant he was, he wanted to follow his main passion outside brewing beer in Liverpool, and that was looking and studying the night sky. And his Starfield Observatory, just outside Liverpool, as we know it today, was established from about 1830. This is an 1857 illustration of the Starfield House in West Derby, Liverpool. West Derby was a very big um, district of Liverpool, not part of the city centre as it is today. Um, and uh, West Derby was actually older uh, than the city itself. West Derby being a village during the, the June Doomsday Book. And uh, at the time, Liverpool was just really a muddy backwater fishing village, whereas West Derby village was the main hub of activity in that part of the Northwest. This is uh, two maps illustrating where Starfields was um, in that red square. Uh, that is actually where Starfield was. And if you look closely at, at the uh, illustration, there are two black dots in, in the corners of the bottom part of the garden, and they are observatories. One for his nine inch telescope, his nine inch speculum telescope, and the other was for his more famous 24-inch speculum mirror telescope, and again, both are mentioned more about it uh, later on. And later, the bottom map is from 1905, and as you can see, the uh, the city has really grown in population, so houses was needed. But I'm glad to say that uh, the city authorities in them days did honour uh, LaSalle by naming one of the streets Starfield Street. Now, as you're all probably very well aware, 
um, at this part of astronomical history, the main mirror, the main material for making mirrors was speculum metal mirrors in different combinations of copper, tin, and in Lasalle's uh, case, he actually added arsenic as well to make it a luster. But speculum mirrors were prone to tarnishing. Um, uh, they were getting very dirty simply because of the atmospherics as well, and not just the bad weather um, from coal dust and, and industrial uh, pollution, which was probably in them days uh, a big problem. And these mirrors would tarnish even after a, 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 perhaps a few hours use, I may have not only had to be cleaned, but also perhaps repolished as well. So it was a bit of a problem for the engineering uh, at the time. But LaSalle was one of those um, self-taught astronomers and engineers that overcame the problem. Um, and again, I'll explain more in a moment. Now, um, he publicized the establishment of Starfield uh, in a paper to the Royal Astronomical Society in London uh, in April 1841. And it's a very good and, and detailed uh, description of his observatory. And in the first uh, observatory he constructed, he established his nine inch um, telescope. All the engineering, the uh, configuring of his mirror and everything to do with the observatory, he did himself, his workshops and the else, self-taught. But if he needed anything manufacturing outside his own sort of area, then he would seek advice and from foundries, as I've already indicated. Again, if we go back to the illustration of 1857, uh, you can actually see evidence of one of the domes at the back. These, this is an illustrated model from the museum and a modern day illustration. Uh, and there's perhaps a, a faint outline of yet another dome uh, in the background behind this tree. But um, the mansion Starfield was actually so big that in uh, later, year, later years when LaSalle moved out of the mansion, he was actually turned into a hospital when he was an outbreak of, of typhoid and other related diseases. One of the first things he was influential to do with was actually the establishment of the Liverpool Observatory in the Waterloo Dock on the Liverpool side of the Mersey, which was established and opened in 1844. And it was actually LaSalle's recommendation that John Char uh, Chapman Hartnup became the first director of this observatory. Um, and he was very, very... Uh, uh, influential and he did a, a very um, precise thing by uh, the observatory's main task and where it got its, some of its funding was, was by testing na uh, maritime chronometers. And Hartnup um, established different rooms within the observatory where he could actually imitate the atmospherics and temperatures that she would go into, whether it be the tropical tropics or uh, very cold um, parts of the world, and imitate those conditions so that chronometers could be tested properly. If you were a ship's captain, you would take your chronometer to the observatory, and for 20 guineas or so, uh, the observatory would test it for you, make it accurate, uh, do any kind of mechanic corrections for you, and then it would be given back to the uh, captain. And in fact, um, in America, chronometers were sent over to Liverpool to be tested uh, and then retested and then sent back uh, um, more so. But the problem was, as I've already indicated, Liverpool was expanding so much that the Waterloo Dock had to expand. So they had to close the observatory and it moved over the other side of the, um, uh, the over the other side of the river to the Bidston site, which uh, this observatory is still there today. Unfortunately, it's no longer working as a 
Astronomical Observatory or Tidal Institute. It closed in the 1970s uh, and now it's an art centre, but hopefully there will be part of the building which will be uh, taken over and um, illustrate its uh, maritime and um, astronomical history. This new observatory in Bidston on the Wirral was opened in 1866 and was on the site of a lighthouse that was there from the 1840s which was used obviously for signaling uh, in bad weather and for the flag signaling system, uh, which was on the promontory on the hill. Um, and uh, if you ever wish to come to this part of the world in September, I believe that, that the observatory will be open for visitors. And one of the domes has actually been renovated recently and you can see um, uh, how it worked and uh, how it was established. And the 1875 uh, lighthouse can actually be seen behind um, the modern day uh, observatory there. Now then, going back to Louis Marcel, he wasn't happy with the nine inch telescope he was using and he wanted to think big. And he wanted to think big with speculum metal mirrors, the technology at the time. So the best person to go and find out about how to manufacture these mirrors and big, big telescopes was of course, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross at Bear Castle in Parsons Town Island. And the famous Leviathan, a 72 inch, 52 foot focus reflector at Bear Castle, which I'm sure you know, you can still see today and within the last few years has actually been renovated. But LaSalle noticed and uh, took down in some of his notebooks and diaries that um, what William Parsons was doing was using uh, timber to build machines which would try and duplicate the human movement of polishing mirrors, smaller mirrors, um, with uh, the help of uh, uh, workmen and so forth. But after his trip back to Liverpool, LaSalle devised uh, mechanical machines with the help of other uh, no, no knowledge engineers to build these. Some of them were steam powered. Uh, one was actually powered by horsepower in the same way that uh, mill owners would grind wheat um, with, the, the, with animal power. And he would, the cell would use pulley systems to try and again imitate the human movement of polishing mirrors. And it was through these machines that he was able to manufacture and um, make big metal speculum mirrors at the time. Now he became friendly with two other Victorian grand amateurs, as Alan Chapman would call them. The first one, of course, was William Rutherford Dawes, Eagle Eye. He was a very astute observer. He was able to check optics for somebody else. He would take away smaller telescopes and test them in his observatory, which he had in Ormskirk before he moved down south. And engineering know-how was, of course, from James Naismith, which I'm sure you know, the famous Scottish engineer um, who had a factory, an engineering factory in Pentecroft, Manchester, and was the inventor, again, as you may know, of the steam hammer. But it was these three gentlemen, it was LaSalle's mini, his engineering know-how to a point, the uh, ability of Rutherdors to check the optics of a telescope, and the engineering know-how of Naismith. This combination, these three great Victorian uh, amateur astronomers, came together to fulfill LaSalle's wishes to build gigantic, large uh, Hubble Space Telescopes of their day in the back garden of a Liverpool uh, mansion. And the most famous of his three great telescopes that LaSalle built was the 24 inch um, speculum mirror telescope. This is a replica we actually built to celebrate the 100 150th anniversary of not just 
just, not just Neptune's discovery, but also the moon Triton, which again was prominent in the cells for life and career. Um, a museum model of what both the nine inch telescope and later the 24 inch telescope would have looked like in two observatories down at the bottom of the Starfield Mansion garden. So basically the 24 inch telescope was a just a, a large uh, enlargement of the nine inch, which worked very well. It had been tested by Rutherford Dawes um, and this is the ambition that LaSalle uh, wanted to do um, and uh, uh, build uh, this great uh, telescope, uh, which was at the bottom of his garden. Now he would host very large um, dinner parties at his mansion in Starfield. Sometimes there was 18 people around his dinner table. But as you may remember or realize that in the Victorian age, uh, after dinner, the ladies would go to a separate room to perhaps uh, um, hear a harpsichord rendition or do sewing or some kind of knitting that way. And the gentlemen would go to another room to smoke their cigars and talk about the business of the day. Not in the LaSalle household. Everyone was gathered together. And if it was clear, they would go down to the bottom of the garden and observe the stars and planets on view if there was any, um, either with the nine inch or the 24 inch. And you can see from LaSalle's own observational diaries and records that uh, he would mention who is observing who and what. It, it might be Mr. Mr. Ince, the local watchmaker, Mr. and Mrs. Price, uh, who lived two, do two doors away, they would tell him how lovely it was to see the stars and planets that night. These are some of the existing parts of the telescope which still exist. Uh, LaSalle was also a very accomplished and good uh, eyepiece manufacturer as well that he constructed. And um, you can see that on one of the, one of the lids of his, one of his eyepieces, he would make notes of the uh, man, uh, the magnifications that some of these eyepieces uh, would give him. That's one of the remaining 24 inch speculum mirror telescopes, uh, mirrors that we have. And this is the uh, three inch speculum mirror finder scope, the, the, the larger 24 inch that uh, still exists today. Excuse me, these are all still uh, viewable in the Liverpool Museum in the city centre today. It gives you an idea of how big the observatory was down at the bottom of the garden by the 30 foot LaSalle dome, which was later in life, once LaSalle had died and passed on, his two daughters, Jane and Caroline, who were also accomplished uh, astronomers in their time, donated to the Royal uh, Greenwich Observatory. And the 24 inch was utilized by Greenwich up until the 1890s, when um, I think by that time it was becoming just too cumbersome to use. Simply because I think of the atmospherics of London, which was also growing as a maritime port. Now then, we come to a stage where usually if I'm giving this talk in a personal manner, we have our tea break. But um, because this is online, uh, we'll carry on. And I want to just mention briefly that LaSalle was involved in the great uh, Neptune discovery story um, of 1845-46. Uh, you may be very well aware that uh, it has caused quite a bit of controversy over the many years. I believe there's about 50 articles being written many, many books is also about the connection between why the British astronomers at the time didn't start looking for this uh, possible new planet, simply that came about from the fact that to Uranus, discovered by Herschel in 1781, uh, was disturbed, being disturbed in its orbit by something else further out in the solar system. 
um, the Cambridge University Observatory was involved in this uh, in this story. Um, the Northumberland uh, 11 and a half inch telescope, which perhaps if history had been different, may have been the telescope that discovered Neptune. But as it was, the foreign um, contingent, primarily Irvine uh, Leverrier, who was a mathematician involved, who predicted the position of Neptune, the letter got sent to the Berlin Observatory and Galleon and the rest were involved in its discovery on the night of the 23rd to the 24th of October, 1846. And sadly, as, as we say, the rest is history. Um, I've always comically said that uh, the foreigners got their towels on the, um, the sun lounges before the British got there, and uh, that's, that's what I... I try to explain. It is a long story, uh, and I could go into a lot of detail, but I'm, I'm in many ways, LaSalle was indirectly or directly involved in this story. Now, uh, there is a, an urban myth to say that when John Herschel demanded that he use his great 24 inch Newtonian telescope to look for uh, Neptune, um, that he was incapacitated. But I think there may have been a problem with the atmospheric where he was in Starfield, or the weather was just too bad, which is a possibility. But the other story is that a maid lost Herschel's uh, letter and he didn't receive it until too late, or he'd sprained his ankle and couldn't get down to the observatory to do his observations. However, it was, uh, I think I'm right in saying it was John Hines, who was the first British observer to tree see Neptune from the U from the UK. But once uh, LaSalle was able to utilize the 24 inch and pointed to where Neptune was, he soon found out the sort of disc. But there was also a hint of a ring as well. And, and there was a 13th magnitude star, which seemed to also move with the planet itself. And this 13th magnitude star uh, turned out to be a, a satellite of the newly discovered planet, which were, for a number of years, Neptune was referred to as Le Verrier uh, by the professionals at that time. Um, if Lissell had been alive in 1989, he probably would have been astounded to see that uh, uh, the, uh, the nitrogen geysers that were photographed uh, and seen by the Voyager 2 flyby. And it's um, um, pondering to see that um, we do know that the ring that he uh, thought he saw was actually a distortion of the speculum mirror, and it was causing astigmatism to the telescope system. So it was a fault of the telescope technology that he built, and he did admit to it in later years. But it's intriguing to note that quite a number of different uh, uh, observers in different sites around the UK also said that uh, Neptune appeared to be elongated and there was evidence of a ring system. But as we know, they were incorrect. But it's intriguing to note that it took a spacecraft flying past the planet itself to reveal that using the backscattering of light from the sun, that Neptune did in fact have a ring system. So the material was very thin and very dark, so it was only seen uh, through a spacecraft. And later technology, uh, when Neptune was able to be going past uh, in front of a, another star, it, it uh, ring system was also identified that way. And it does take uh, um, technology like the James Webb Space Telescope to produce an image like this with Neptune and its very distinct um, uh, ring system. And again, it's sad to think that uh, uh, LaSalle's not with us to see that uh, his ring system, not as extensive, not as bright as Saturn, but a ring system nonetheless did actually exist. 
The cell was in constant competition with William Couch Bond, who not only uh, had 15 degrees of extra sky to play with, but was probably in need of a hairdryer as well. Um, and they were joint discoveries of Saturn's moon uh, Hyperion in 1848. And Bond always seemed to be just a little few steps ahead of LaSalle in any discoveries. This is uh, a, a lovely uh, image taken by the Cassini spacecraft of Hyperion. And as you can see, it looks like a bathroom sponge. But um, by this time, LaSalle really was at the top of his game. He was very famous. He was the superstar the Hollywood star of Victorian astronomer, astronomy. If you were any kind of uh, professional astronomer going to conferences in Edinburgh or maybe Dublin or even London, and you were going home, you would make a beeline, if you could, uh, to Liverpool and visit LaSalle. And the story is that George Bidleary, who'd been to a, a meeting in Dublin, um, was going back to London via Liverpool and called in on LaSalle uh, to have dinner, perhaps uh, do some observations. And when uh, George Bidleary left, he'd forgotten a night shirt uh, they hadn't taken with him. Um, LaSalle's um, household staff very kindly laundered his night shirt. And then the Russian observer, Otto Struva, called in to LaSalle and asked uh, if he was to meet George Bidleary later on that very month. And he said, yes. And LaSalle said, would you mind giving back his night shirt for him? So you had to be somebody, if you were using a Russian famous astronomer as a laundry boy, um, and to pass on uh, the night shirt owned by the uh, Astronomer Royal. So he was somebody of note. And he was even... Uh, royal stamp, a royal seal of uh, approval. When the royal couple, um, Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, visited Liverpool in October 1851, they stayed in the Croxteth Mansion of Croxteth Hall and Park, which was actually not too far away from where LaSalle had moved to, Bradstones, which I'll mention in a moment. And he was actually invited to be a guest of a banquet in the night of uh, the 9th to the 10th of October when the royal couple stayed at Croxteth Hall. And the urban myth is that when LaSalle entered the room, because there was an audience with the royal couple, the royal couple rose to greet the astronomer and not the other way around. And as you may note, that Prince Albert was very interested in industry and science and promoted the railways uh, at the time. So LaSalle uh, was given the royal seal of approval even then. Someone of note. This is his second home in, sorry, his third home in Liverpool, Bradstones, which was 12 miles, 12 miles further out from the city centre and is actually where he constructed his great 48-inch telescope. Sadly, this photograph was taken in 1972 because the mansion no longer uh, exists. But it was an 18-bedroomed mansion which he had built. Um, you can see at the back of this photograph some of the existing workshops. And the mansion was later used by the, um, uh, the Royal Red Cross Society in 1927. And they note in their historical books that there was actually a circular white patch, uh, and that's where LaSalle would test his telescopes on the chimneys and windows of merchants who lived on the other side of the river on the Wirral um, uh, to test out his eyepieces. This is a 1927 map of the area around Bradstones, and as you can see, he surrounded by other great mansions where other uh, merchants lived, tobacconists, people who manufactured um, railway engines, uh, all the, the people who had cotton mills. 
any kind of manufacturer who was wealthy lived in this area uh, of West Derby uh, in, ninth, in uh, around the time Lassell was here, in, primarily in the 1850s. And there is a note that one of his visitors here at Bradstones was uh, uh, Sir John Herschel. Now, as you can imagine, Liverpool was expanding uh, over many years industrially as well as a maritime port, and the cell got really fed up. In fact, in one of the diaries, uh, William Rutherdors mentions to the cell that he should actually rename Starfield Cloudfield because of the conditions uh, from the factories and the weather. Sometimes they would spend 11 hours outside uh, the observatory without any kind of clear sky whatsoever. Something I'm sure that we can also uh, relate to even today. But uh, he got so fed up that he decided to move everything, the observatory, the workshops, family, household, to the maritime naval port in Malta. Uh, and his first visit there was between 1851 and 53. The ship you can see at the bottom is the Cunard liner, the SS Damascus. Uh, and I've seen the manifest uh, of one of the trips of La Salle made. And he does have his telescope, which was in 253 packing cases. His um, horse and carts were taken with him. And it also mentions a grand piano, which I think was probably related to the dinner parties that he would still have hold in Malta. Malta, of course, was an ideal place really for him to set up uh, for its climate, its clear skies, its uh, clarity, its um, seeing conditions. And also it was a stopping off point for the supplies to the Crimean War, uh, primarily in the 1850s. So for him, it was uh, uh, in many ways an ideal part. But again, a lot of Victorian professional astronomers was visit uh, La Salle uh, um, to, uh, and La Salle would host dinner parties, but again, would also uh, illustrate his um, telescopes and observational methods. But it's his third great telescope that he utilized mostly in Malta between 1861 and 64. And that was the great 48-inch telescope, which uh, was so big, it didn't really have any enclosure, no dome at all. Um, it had a lift system. So if there was an object which was uh, close to the zenith or above, straight above, you'd need to look at the eyepiece. Uh, there'd be someone at the eyepiece shouting down observations and someone noting it at the bottom. Sometimes it would be LaSalle's da daughters, Jane and Carolyn. I'm just taking a drink. Now, um, I understand that the way it kept in motion and the, it would cancel out the movement of uh, objects in the night sky, planets and nebulae that he would look at, there would be a navi who would be utilizing a metronome system on a piano to use a, a lever so that the whole platform would move around. It, it was very novel as well. They had a skeleton tube and not like an enclosed tube so that there was any uh, hot vapors or um, uh, problems with the atmospherics, it would move through the tube and not cause too much uh, trouble uh, with the optics. And again, he did have problems with the tarnishing of the speculum mirrors. And he would sometimes construct three or four mirrors uh, to do with the telescope. So if mirror B was not um, giving the clarity he needed, he would take B out, put C in, which had been recently cleaned and polished, and uh, uh, make sure that B was, um, so that was the kind of system he was using. Several different primary mirrors would be constructed uh, so that he was constantly in use uh, with the 48 inch. The site of the 48 inch was uh, Trinicant um, Promontory, which is here uh, on this map. It's 
around the part of the fort. Unfortunately, it's now being engrossed by um, holiday apartments and hotels, but it was this part of the area on the promontory overlooking Letta in Malta where the 48 inch was uh, constructed and established. This is uh, the mirror B from the 48 inch, which was actually found quite back and within the confines of the Wirral History of Science Museum in Cambridge in, uh, in I think the 1970s. And there's actually still inside a handwritten note dated July the 9th, 1875 by LaSalle saying the last time it was polished and cleaned for use in the telescope. He employed a German astronomer assistant who was really re um, mentioned as a calculator. And there is a story that uh, when Lassell had quite a number of dinner guests, he said to Albert, um, I'm, not in, I'm, I'm not really using the 24 inch tonight. Please uh, utilize it for your own observations, which Albert would, would do. And Albert Marth was his assistant on both his trips uh, to Malta in the 1850s and 60s. This is uh, um, just to give you an idea of what the 24 inch and the, probably the 48 inch could give him with his favorite planet, of course, uh, Saturn. He was a very extensive uh, observer. He didn't really uh, look at the moon, but it was the outer planets which uh, uh, he was always observing and the newly discovered um, uh, Neptune as well. But it was Saturn which he was um, always looking at uh, when he was high enough in the sky, even in Liverpool or Malta. And uh, he made quite a number of discoveries to do with Saturn. Of course, some satellites, the Great Ring, which I think he saw along with William Rutter Dawes, and a um, number of satellites to do with Uranus, and of course, Triton connected with Neptune. Now, um, I need to point out that um, his daughters, Jane and Carlin, were very accomplished artists and uh, he would illustrate um, some of the observations with their help. And he was a very accomplished uh, um, observer as well, not only detailing the in, in text what he saw in his observational books, but he would translate it uh, into very fine visual illustrations um, that he would keep in his notebooks. And I think this one is an observation with the 24 inch from uh, Valletta between the 4th and 13th of November, 1852. Now, um, his Fortes to Malta finished in uh, late 1862, 63. And he didn't uh, move back to Liverpool. He actually moved back to um, Maidenhead in the south of England to Ray Lodge, this um, mansion here, which is the only mansion that was uh, already built when he moved in. He never had this built primarily for him. And the, uh, the later uh, uh, people who ran the city honoured LaSalle by naming the road where Ray Lodge is, LaSalle Gardens. I can say too, and you'll find this very, very funny, that uh, if you remember, LaSalle was a very accomplished brewer associated with the alcohol industry in both Liverpool, the northwest of England and the UK. That when I went to Maidenhead in 1993, as part of the Replica Telescope project, the Ray Lodge was actually being converted into a Betty Ford clinic for alcoholics. Um, his later brewery, which moved from Liverpool, was established in North Wales and it went into um, partnership uh, with the Sharman family. The Sharman family actually married into the LaSalle family. They were mainly to do with the shoe and boot industry in Northamptonshire, but uh, one of the uh, members of the Sharman family uh, was also a brewer and they established a brewery from 1871 in the North Wales area. 
unfortunately closed in the 1890s and was taken over by Green or Whitley. Um, but you can still find remnants of the LaSalle um, and Charmin Brewery in bottles, um, alcohol containers, gin bottles, and also beer mats as well. And that's an illustration of the brewery in, um, in North Wales, much bigger establishment than he did have in Liverpool. Now then, this is actually a fine example of, if you are into researching astronomical history, it's to never give up your research. There's always something out there that you can find quite by accident. When I was going through Scottish newspapers, believe it or not, primarily Scottish news newspapers that were from Glasgow, I found this court case report to do with William LaSalle's son, his junior, 1828 to 1875. He predeceased his father, the astronomer. Now, of course, the son was taking over the brewery, um, running of the brewery when his father was really uh, into his astronomy, specifically to do with his trips to Malta. But it turns out that um, his son, William, uh, which confused with the family history, uh, was inflicted with the social disease of the Victorian age of syphilis, and it became a mental illness. Um, he was in court to see he was compass mentis, that he could uh, take care of his family, he could run the business, but he was actually in a mental asylum in just outside Glasgow, um, and this was the court case that was reported on. It um, indicates that his son William was inflicted with this uh, neurological disease and uh, said that he was married to the, to the Queen. He called himself the, uh, the Duke of Hamilton um, and that kind of thing. He was not in a very fit state. And there is an indication that this is kept quiet because at the same time at this court case, um, William was the astronomer was the president of the Royal Astronomical Society in London. So it may have been kept quiet because it could quite well have been a bit of a scandal. Now, sadly, as you can see, his son deceased him in 1875. And um, there was an indication that uh, he did have William, the astronomer, made a change to his will, uh, which we thought originally was to do with um, him having a bit of a bad run on railway shares, but it was to do the fact that his son uh, had predeceased them uh, through this infliction. And in fact, the son is buried in a, uh, in a, a churchyard in Edinburgh to do with the village of Dollar, which I believe is near Murrayfield. Um, so that's where his son is buried. And you can still see the grave stone today. Now, uh, LaSalle had retired by this time to Maidenhead. He still utilized the 24 inch, but the 48 inch unfortunately was broken up um, of the metal scrap and sold. It was offered to the um, Australian Astronomical Society um, for their use as a telescope in Australia, but they declined and they had one built by the Great Dublin uh, telescope constructor, uh, Grub Parsons. So LaSalle had the 14 broken up and most of it was um, met, met, sorry, met, melted down uh, for scrap metal. And in fact, he, LaSalle did write to the publication, The Observer, saying that he could, he heard the workmen smashing the 48 inch uh, speculum metal mirrors um, on the day that uh, he finally said goodbye to the 48 inch. These three uh, Victorian images are from the fact when he was uh, president of the Royal Astronomical Society, a different uh, part of the formation. I think this one has been slightly altered and may have been the, the actual presidential portrait because this one uh, clearly indicates an astronomer who has spent many a night at the eyepiece with the bags under the eyes. And here's the standing portrait 
which again was utilized uh, in, in many of his publications. The uh, family uh, which I was able to trace for the LaSalle Replica Telescope project uh, in the 1990s, uh, I visited and um, they had this lovely brooch, monogrammed brooch, which I believe was a wedding present from wife to husband, monogrammed with a WL. And if you open it, it's got a nice portrait of uh, the astronomer and the lock of his hair. And Alan Chapman suggested to me that I should take the lock of hair, um, have um, DNA duplicated so we could have many hundreds of LaSalle's running around the country, which is a lovely idea. LaSalle finally passed away in October 1880. Um, he's buried in St. Luke's uh, churchyard in Mainhead. This is a photograph I took uh, at the time. Uh, it's sad to think that he could well have been an honorary member of my own society because we were established from October 1881, just a year after he passed away. So uh, it, it, it's ironic that history could have been a bit different, but uh, unfortunately it wasn't. And um, I did contact the local Astronomical Society Maidenhead and they found to the utter horror that the LaSalle's grave had been neglected over many years. So they took their own project and they cleaned the, uh, the stone up. Um, and now it's something that uh, they honored. The location of which they didn't really realize uh, where it was in St. Luke's churchyard, but it was located and they managed to uh, renovate it and clean it up. And as you can see, uh, in memory of William Sell of Ray Lodge, died October, um, I think it's the 10th, 1880, aged 81. Just a year later, Maria, his wife, followed him and they're buried together. So in conclusion, I have overrun a little bit, I'm sorry, but just to say that um, his discoveries, he uh, observed the, the trapezium in M42 uh, in 1842. He was one of the several observers to observe that. Neptune's chief moon Triton, of course, in 1846, surrounded by that story of the, uh, the, the Germans uh, and the French getting there first. Saturn's eighth satellite Hyperion, which he jointly discovered with Bond in Harvard, Massachusetts, America. Saturn's crepe ring, uh, which he first saw with Dawes and Bond. Uh, two faint moons of Uranus, Ariel and Umbriel in 1851, and he catalogued 600 different types of nebulae in 1866 uh, with uh, Albert Marth uh, in Malta. And of course, as I've illustrated, he constructed and designed large specular mirror uh, equatorial telescopes weighing several tons, but you could actually push with your finger uh, the construction was so detailed and intricate. And um, we were planning uh, to re-display the replica 24-inch telescope that uh, I mentioned earlier on in my talk uh, that we built for the 150th anniversary, which we were going to do again in one, uh, for the 175th in 2021. But unfortunately, the COVID the pandemic got there first. So unfortunately, uh, it's still in storage, but we are hoping um, at some stage in the next few years, it could be taken out of storage and placed back in a very large uh, auditorium, uh, which the museum now has. And that would be very nice indeed uh, to try and do that if we can. Now to bring this talk to a close, um, this is the Observatory Public House, which is in Birkenhead, Wirral, which is not too far away from the Bidston Observatory I told you about. So you can imagine the observers in Bidston saying to their wives, I'm just going down to the observatory, my darling, I'll be some time later on. And this is an illustration from the Liverpool Echo newspaper uh, that was printed during the 1927 total solar eclipse 
So as you can see, uh, the drinking of alcohol, primarily beer and astronomy, still carry on today in Liverpool. If you want to know more in the text, I've actually written a booklet with the help of the Society of the History of Astronomy. And uh, if you contact Nigel or Mark, um, uh, uh, and I will try and get some copies to you. It, it's out of print at the moment, all 80 copies, sorry, all 40 copies that we had produced have sold out. But uh, if you want a copy for your own library, I'm sure I can get one to you with the help of either Nigel or Mark. So um, thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for being here. Any questions or answers, please? If we move on to questions, can we thank Jared for that? That was an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. What an interesting guy. Um, I, I I knew the name. I knew approximately who he was, but such a lot more to him. And he'd fit in the society really well, always wanting a bigger and better telescope, just like the rest of the people. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we? Uh, are there any questions, please? I'll let share my screen. Is that better for you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. You can see everyone. Have you got okay. any questions? Who... Um, Peter, are you going to read anything in the chat? There are, there's, uh, there's a couple there. Uh, Ian's asking if LaSalle is of French origin. Well, yes. Um, it's I, I, I really have to thank Alan Chapman, who thinks it's, um, the LaSalle name is from the uh, French. It may have been a family connected with the French Revolution, and they may have made their way to Britain to do that. The earliest LaSalle I know of was a little bit earlier, though, than um, the French Revolution. They were established in the north part of Lancashire from as early as 1671. But I think a large number of the LaSalle family may have um, emigrated to the UK to get away from the French Revolution. But having said that, I'm not really sure, but I think you quite correct that it must have some French connotation to it. Thank you. <clears throat> Quick one, do you think he'd be, if he was alive now, he'd be searching for Planet Nine? <laughs> um, well, I, um, I'm surprised he never, um, he never got interested in taking photography, he never used um, photography is a method of observations. I mean, it was, it was clearly a method for uh, doing astronomy as obviously as early as the 1850s. And um, he would uh, persevere with specular mirrors, but um, he, he was uh, a very broad observer. I mean, he, he was mainly interested in the outer planets, but he observed comets. Uh, he was a great observer of Mars. Um, he ventured to uh, Sweden to see the 1851 eclipse. So he was a broad um, church, so to speak, observer. And he never really right. um, concentrated on one aspect of astronomy. Um, but I'm surprised he never really uh, dabbled with uh, astrophotography, even in the later stages of his life. Could I, could I ask, uh, uh, thanks very much, Gerard, that was absolutely fascinating. I just wanted to ask, uh, since since he, he was um, such an accomplished maker of telescopes, did he ever make a business out of that? Did he ever make telescopes for other other people or or, or sell them? Or, or did he always make telescopes for his own use? There's, there's no indication he, he did in a similar way to uh, William Herschel. William Herschel was like that. He sold many telescopes of different sizes. Um, but LaSalle kept him, he, he, as I've said, he, he utilised advice and the skill of others, um, but he seemed to just put it into building his own telescopes and utilising it himself. He never, um, he never passed on uh, telescopes. I think that I'm, I'm not too sure what happened to the nine inch, the first great telescope he built. 
But to answer your question, he never did, no. He never went into the manufacturing of telescopes in the same way. He was purely aimed at making bigger and better. He wanted to see more detail and further out into space if he could. Yeah. And as I've indicated, in in many ways, for the time period he did, he, he was a pioneer in the design of telescopes, big, heavy telescopes that could be easy easily easily utilized um but he he, uh, he just kept those three telescopes he did have smaller ones that he did take smaller telescopes but it was um what i would call shop bought um they were you know he, he bought them from a catalog that were available at the time and he would utilize them for his star parties and perhaps um, gave them to his daughters um who became a um, as I said, a, a country astronomers, and um, I think Jane and Calvin went to an eclipse with party from the BAA uh, in 1871, and they had telescopes which once owned by their father. Wow! Thank you. Well, that's everything on Zoom, I think, Mark. Uh, Ramsey, anything on YouTube? Uh, nothing on YouTube. And uh, no questions that I see, but oh, I, I, I see, I just, I see one actually. All right. Maybe they're going to different chat to me. <laughs> uh, Troglodytes is asking: Has anything astronomical been named for William Lassell? Um, well, there's, there's, there's the new, there's a crater, um, which is quite close to the Straight Wall. If you want to see oh. it, um, any moon map will show it. There's um, one of the rings. The International Astronomical Union have named one of Neptune's rings after him, but there's a Leverrier ring and there's a Gala ring as well. So all the astronomers associated with the discovery of Neptune, I think, have been honoured. Yeah. I think, um, I'm not too sure, there might be a, a, a crater on Mars named after him. Um, there's a few streets. I think there's a railway engine. I'm not too sure about that. There might be a railway <laughs> engine. Um, but he is he is honoured. He's been on a few stamps as well. Uh, I think Malta honoured him quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, in the solar system, there's a number of objects. I'm not too sure there's an asteroid named after him, um, but um, there's definitely a crater on the moon. I think he must be the only uh, astronomer not to have an asteroid named after him. There are so many of them. You know, <laughs> names, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they'll never run out of asteroids to be named. Yeah, that's right. I'm um, hoping that might be a Gilligan one soon. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I have a question. So you, you said he catalogued 600 uh, nebulae. So is there a LaSalle La catalog available with his well, name? Well, the, the catalog is really a, an article in the Royal Astronomers, Astronomical um, Society Journal. Um, I think there's a few star clusters as well, not not globulars, but uh, 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 expanded uh, star clusters that he noticed as well. But um, the interesting story, to answer your question in a roundabout way, is that um, uh, it was actually Albert Marth that mapped a few, quite a number of them, but LaSalle got the his name ahead in the article, so to speak. So. Right. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it, so there's no there's no catalogue as such. It's just a a massive oh. big article, and the, the positions of all these nebulae uh, are listed there. Yep. Okay. That's that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, can we thank Jared again? Thank you. Thank you.